made up of mysterious peaks and ancient fjords. These isolated islands in the north of Norway were once called the Land of the Gods in Viking legend. Join us as we journey through Lofoten, nature's masterpiece of jagged mountains and a bountiful sea, once ruled by mighty sailors basking under the midnight sun. This is hard work. still enjoying the Scandinavian countryside, exploring the area close to the Arctic Circle. My friend Lars and I have just come from Kiruna, Sweden's northernmost town, and now heading for the border to Norway. There is nothing better than driving a Swedish car in the Scandinavian countryside. It's a good car for this type of uh, country. Sometimes it's rain, sometimes it's snow. Well, we've got the all-wheel drive here. Yes. And uh, what, what a beautiful view. Uh, it's a Kepenegaise massive. It's the highest uh, mountain in Sweden. Oh, this one is the highest yes. mountain in Sweden. It was a comfortable drive with a trusty Volvo XC60 passing through the Lapland's rugged beauty. I could tell Lars enjoyed driving it too. The frozen, barren landscape soon gave way to emerald mountains and alpine lakes as we reached the Lofoten Islands. Lars and I couldn't help but stop to admire the remarkable scenery. Lofoten is made up of five major islands. Its mountains are more than three billion years old, older than most of Northern Europe. The last ice age carved the valleys, and water dug the fjords and straits that divided the landscape. It was truly an enchanting place that the Vikings called it the Land of the Gods. Lars and I set off to learn about the legends and lore that make up these mystical islands. Flocks of seagulls are a common sight in these coastal waters. But another kind of seabird that is often seen here are the ones cast in iron. In the town of Sun, we see flocks of cormorants immortalized by the blacksmith of Sun. He started to make the cormorants in the beginning of the 60s and so it was known, well known. The area was known for the yeah. cormorants. But you know, the cormorants, it's um, in Norway and I, I guess it's um, a privilege to can be able to do this for a living. In this region of Norway, these birds are considered sacred. People who die far out at sea are said to visit their homes in the form of cormorants. Torvergard is continuing this tradition of metalwork passed on to him by his predecessor, Hans Gersten, who presented King Olaf V his own iron cormorant. Standing in the warm glow of the forge, we watch Torvergard skillfully hammering away at the iron, fashioning it as he pleases. So, um, yes, this is, this is the start, yes. the beginning. And then later I continue <coughs> and make, uh, make legs and tail. What is the ideal temperature? Yeah, around 1,000. 1,000. It depends what you are, uh, what you are going to do. But when you start um, the operation as a forging operation, then you 
need as high as, high, possible. High, yeah, as high as possible because it's easier to <clears throat> work with. Making these sculptures using traditional forging methods, no two cormorants will come out alike. It was a very long neck cormorant. So, uh, I had to cheat a little bit. But maybe it's a new race. I had just to form the neck a little bit better. Then I will make it stand. And after that, I will make a, a pair of wings. The pounding echo of the blacksmith's hammer is reminiscent of a proud society who lived in these islands thousands of years ago. In the town of Borg, an imposing structure stands on top of a hill. It is a Viking chieftain's longhouse, reconstructed based on the remains of the largest Viking-era house ever found. Its discovery shed new light on Lofoten's history. This was an area that was a power center in the Viking Age. Mm. Uh, so the building that we have reconstructed, it's a chieftain's residence for a chieftain of power over a great part of the Lofoten Islands. Luxury items like jewelry, pieces of glass, gold amulets, and other unusual finds indicate that a rich and powerful man owned the house. This was from about 700 AD, which is in the Iron Age, before the Viking Age. And it's a time when glass was ex very expensive, probably more expensive than gold. Right. The house was 274 feet long and had enough space to accommodate even livestock inside. To survive Norway's harsh winters, a warm hearth and animal furs and pelts made the house very cozy. We think there were four main rooms, and the part that we are in, we call it the living quarters. Mm -hmm. And we believe this is the part of the original building, yes. or corresponds to the part of the original building, where the servants and crafters of the chieftain would have both slept, cook food over fire, they would eat, mm -hmm. and do various domestic crafts, which probably means primarily women's work. We I think see. the crafts done by men were to a large degree done outside or in separate buildings. Most people would think of Vikings only as the fierce warriors that they are. But they were actually also very good craftsmen. They wove colorful textiles and used animal hide for footwear. They also did a lot of skilled woodworking and carving. Food supply was also stored inside the house, and it gave us a glimpse of what the Vikings' diet was like. So we see that the diet also contains a lot of fish, yes. but these are bigger bones. <laughs> well, these bones are goat bones. Okay. Uh, we are on the chieftain seat. Uh, many regular people, they probably did not have a lot of meat in their diet. They mm. would eat more fish. Fish, yes. Uh, but uh, a wealthy chieftain, he would show it off by having a diet containing quite a lot more meat mm. than normal. Speaking of food, the house had a great banquet hall that can gather all 50 to 80 of its inhabitants for any kind of feast. That would be uh, any sort of celebration to celebrate weddings, childbirths, Visits from family, uh, visits from other chieftains, then political events, and even religious ceremony. The chieftain and his family might have used this room as their personal living room. The longhouse survived for four centuries and was inhabited by a few generations of Viking chieftains. Historical records show that the last chieftain who lived here was the oddly named Olaf Venom Bruni, or Olaf Twin Brows. He was called a hammeram, or someone who could shed his skin and turn into an animal. A Viking werewolf, perhaps? But around 900 AD, Olaf and his family left this place to go and conquer parts of Iceland. Olaf 
would have sailed on a ship like this one. This is a two-third replica of the Gokstad, the same Viking ship displayed at the museum in Oslo. Lofoten may seem isolated today, but during the Viking Age, it was the center of a maritime trade network. With their fast ships that can be used for warfare, trade, or transport, they dominated these waters. So I travel around a lot. Very interesting life, I think, during the time, huh? But a hard life. Mm, I can imagine. It was very interesting to step back in time and learn more about Viking life. Though I wish Lars would play Cupid and shoot these girls with some arrows. Unfortunately, they were better warriors than me. <laughs> Up next, I explore more of the fairy tale islands of Lofoten, discovering its rich fishing heritage that has shaped this place for thousands of years. My friend Lars and I are still exploring the scenic Lofoten Islands. We weave through the nice roads, test driving the Volvo XC60. One thing good about it is that I get to have a lot of information in my cockpit. I have one multifunction display here and I have one right here in my speed is right there. My route guide is here as well. I don't have to look on the side. So with a beautiful view like this, ah, this is very nice. The water and the mountains, your hand position for your gear is just right. It was such a pleasant drive that we didn't notice it's already close to midnight. That's another sampling of Lofoten's magic, the midnight sun. During the summer, areas above the Arctic Circle experience the sun for 24 hours. This is caused by the Earth's tilt on its axis. Rotating around the sun, the Earth's inclination causes these areas to be exposed to the sun, keeping them illuminated even when the Earth is spinning. The effect is seeing the sun setting only to rise back again over the horizon. It began to drizzle as we arrived in Arorbu, a typical fisherman's house where Lars and I will stay in the next few days. There was more exploring to do, but I needed a good night's sleep, even if the sun was already out. As we drove around, we saw wooden beams filled with dried fish. Stockfish is unsalted fish dried by cold wind and air, and hang by wooden racks. This kind of food can last for many, many years. Stockfish is Norway's longest sustained export commodity, from the Viking Age to the medieval period. They don't need to be salted or smoked, as the temperature here is just below freezing, so the fish don't freeze or rot. They simply dry out and keep their nutrients. Every winter, the Arctic cod travels from the barren seas by the millions to Lofoten's warmer waters where they spawn. They come in such big numbers that the fishermen from the entire coast of Norway take part in the fishery. Stockfish has fed countries like Iceland that it is considered a staple food like bread. Lars and I visit the Lofoten Fishing Museum in O to learn more about the history of fishing here. Showcasing the last 250 years of Norway's fishing history, the Fishing Museum was a good insight into the industry that built these very islands. We went inside a typical Rorbu or fisherman's house. So Lars, this is a uh, 
Typical fisherman's house, huh? Yes. Looks like so. Well, they have a fish even there. Yeah. <laughs> it, it must be in uh, hard times. Well, yes. It must be cold here. These Rorbu were often cramped quarters, with two to three men sleeping head to feet in single beds. They would have to endure the cold and wet winters as the fishing season came to Lofoten. And all their fishing gear is just outside of the next room. Yes, it's a they went up with small boats and use their nets mm -hmm. and with a hook to take up the fish. Most of these homes are built on poles over the water and are typically painted red, the cheapest color at the time. The old Yorbu cabins have been transformed to guest houses. Lars and I also went to the boathouse where we saw the type of boats used by fishermen at the time. So Lars, these are the typical boats in the past, huh? Like a, oh, like a Viking yes. boat, I see. And this is made out of wood? Yes, made of wood. Yeah, wood, all together, huh? So it has a deep cut. Easy to force to sail. Yes. Yeah. Easy to go. These Nordland boats dominated Lofoten's waters at that time. They were made of light timber and can move fast across the water. With the abundance of codfish being caught, another lucrative product in Lofoten was cod liver oil. So this is where they make this cod liver oil. Yes. I can never forget this, Lars, because my, my mother always wants me to take this. Cod liver oil is known for its health properties, containing omega-3 and vitamins A and D. But in earlier times, it was used to fuel oil lamps and tan leather hides. Today, one can still see and even smell the remnants of this old cod liver oil factory where the museum stands. From the age of the Vikings up to the present time, there is no denying the fact that the arrival of the cod on these waters has helped build this nation to what it is today. Up next, will the gods look kindly on me as I venture into the waters of Lofoten and try out my luck in fishing? Stick around to find out. I'm still enjoying Lofoten's enchanting scenery and the colorful history that shaped these islands. But perhaps there is no better way to complete the experience than by boarding a boat and trying out fishing in these bountiful waters. Uh, we're going to spend about one hour now to get out to the fishing field. Uh, we, uh, we want to have the best chances of getting some decent uh, catch. With our flotation suits, we sailed out to the open waters. From out here, you can see the most breathtaking views of the Lofoten Islands. While we sailed, I got to chat with the boat captain, Lars Larsen. My father was a fisherman and also went up in the uh, Arctic to hunt for the seals. Wow! Yeah. Did you ever have the chance to do that? No, no, no. <laughs> I wish I could one day. What is the most interesting catch you've had while fishing? You took this trolling. Yes. And you saw a lot of fish and you... Different kinds. Yeah. And then you waited for this uh, troll to come up. It was exciting. <laughs> yeah. How much is it to yeah. come up on the sea? And, oh, it's a lot of fish. This is really exciting. If I get uh, something really big, mm. got a big cod or big side, it's mm -hmm. really exciting to see what yes. it is and how big it is, or if it's just one. <laughs> I hope we could get his kind of luck and bring home a big one. Our boat was equipped with jigger wheels used for deep sea fishing. Well, it's uh, bottom line fishing, so it's really heavy. 
and uh, to make it easier for us, they've got this big reel that I can pull. They say there's always a catch. There has never been a day without any catch. But I haven't been in this boat yet, so this we have to see. The flocking seagulls signal that we were close to the fishing fields. I think this is pretty much the spot. There's another fishing boat there, and the seagulls are here. You know, when the seagulls are around, it's a sign that there's, there's fish out there. Ah, the view here is just fantastic. After a quick briefing, Lars and I set out to work. First, we lower the line and rubber baits down to the bottom of the sea. Then, we lift it up for 2 to 3 meters and wait for a bite for 5 to 10 minutes. If no fish takes it, we reel it up again. The line always felt heavy because of the depth of the water. And the waves in these parts were difficult to contend with. But Lars and I were determined to catch a big one. This is hard work. <laughs> I'm starting to sweat. I was so cold earlier. Finally, something bit. Got one! <laughs> what kind of fish is this? Oh, okay. Yeah. Woohoo! It's big. I, I thought I lost it, but then it was there. <laughs> Thank you. That's good. <sighs> it was a saita, or pole fish of the cod family. Well, my fishing luck seemed to be rubbing off on everyone. Wow, that's a nice one, huh? What's that? What kind of fish is that? Cod. Okay. Finally, I got my hands on a Norwegian cod myself. Okay, not, not so big. Not so big, but it's okay. Yeah, I wait for the big cod for a good photo. <laughs> True enough, good things come to those who wait. <laughs> Thank you, Lars. <laughs> That's a big one, huh? What kind of fish is this? Linfish. Okay. Really? It was a whopping 37 kilos. I finally had the perfect fishing photo to send to all my friends. It's just too bad I didn't catch it myself. It was caught by expert fisherman Newt Corsell. Well, for sure he caught it, not me. <laughs> It's a big one. Congratulations. Woo! It was so big. Our boat captain, Lars, cleans and guts all the fish we caught. Of course, we didn't forget to feed the hungry seagulls that have been following us. <laughs> They're quick. Look how quick they are. Yeah. Meanwhile, back in our roar booth, it was Lars' turn to feed this hungry land bird. Oh. You catch your big fish, yeah, here it is. Okay. <laughs> Try to show it to you. Just the salt and butter. And you have the real taste of cut. You're not only a good sailor, but also a good cook. It's so fresh, yeah? Mm. Very nice. Skål! Skål! For a good dinner. Thank you. It was a perfect end to my adventure in Lofoten. An isolated, fairy tale world home to mighty warriors and hardy sailors, whose legends continue to live on in these islands of untold beauty. This has been your captain, Joy Roa. See you in the next Asian Air Safari.